And joining us now on the line from Victoria, British Columbia, Elizabeth May, leader of the Green Party of Canada, who's running in the riding of Saanich Gulf Islands. Ms. May, how are you and how's life on the left coast? Everything's lovely out here, Steve, and my tour across Canada was great too. Support for Greens is, is still strong despite uh, what was surely a blow to our campaign and exclusion from the leaders' debate. We shall talk about that and many other things over the course of the next 20 plus minutes. But let me start with this. Three years ago, the 2008 national election, 20% of Canadians, when they were surveyed, felt that the environment was the most important issue facing Canada. We even had Stéphane Dion, as you know, run on the green shift for the Liberal Party. But a recent poll found that that number has now dropped to just 5% of Canadians. And I wonder how difficult it is for you to get traction on an issue that you are obviously so clearly associated with when so much support for the environment seems to have dropped off the table. Well, I think you have to look at the fact that support for the environment has not dropped off the table. The poll you just quoted was the top of mind issue. What is your top concern? But if you ask Canadians, are you concerned about the climate crisis? Do you accept the science of the climate crisis? Do you want to see action? That's holding steady at 80%, which shows that Canadians are far more concerned with the climate crisis than our neighbors south of the border. So, it, you know, and, and then people always, you know, for the Green Party, there's no, there's no succeeding in, in media punditry. In 2008, all the media questions to me were, why is the Green Party relevant when every other party is championing climate? And in 2011, it's, how can the Green Party be relevant because climate isn't an issue? So I find it uh, somewhat frustrating. We will champion the issues that are real concerns, whether they're flavor of the month or not. Unlike other parties, we do not drop our concern relating to the climate crisis because some in the media have decided and, and some, as you say, the top of mind polls, naturally people are going to respond to what they're reading and seeing in the newspapers. So it's sort of a circular argument. Yes, we're coming out of recession, so there's a lot more concern about the economy. There's a lot more concern about our health care crisis. The health care crisis rates is higher than the economy in top of mind questions. So we know Canadians are looking at you know, what is their quality of life, what are we doing about, about issues of real concern, uh, bread and butter issues. But the reality of the climate crisis is that if we approach it the way we should be, we'd be embracing the challenge of shifting our economy off fossil fuels to create the jobs to sustain a healthy economy, invest in our health care system. So for Greens to get traction, actually, we just need to be able to talk about our platform and share that with people because it's a very sensible, down-to-earth platform that speaks to all these issues. We're going to do some of that again uh, during the course of our discussion here today. But I, know, I suspect you saw Andrew Potter's column in McLean's magazine from a few days ago. And in case our viewers did not, let me just read an excerpt of it and I'll get you to comment on it. Andrew wrote, what is remarkable about this election campaign is how little interest the Green Party seems to have in pushing environmental issues onto the national table. Instead, their overarching campaign narrative is of the party's ongoing suffering at the hands of our broken, obsolete, unjust, and undemocratic electoral system. If only we had proportional representation, goes the plaintive cry, the Greens would be serious players in Parliament. Now, while that is true, if we did have PR, you certainly would be bigger players on the national scene. I wonder whether, again, Andrew's point isn't on insofar as Michael Ignatieff is doing a lot of talking about respect for institutions and the democratic deficit and his polling numbers seem stuck. Uh, you're championing an issue of electoral reform. Your polling numbers seem stuck. Is this a missed opportunity for you guys? I think it's a, a missed opportunity for Andrew Potter to actually listen to what we've been saying in this election campaign. I have, I, I'm just madly fond of Andrew Potter, so it's a, nothing to do with what he just wrote. But I can tell you, had, he, had the media been covering the rallies that we've had across Canada, we've had packed rallies in Toronto, in Montreal, in Halifax, in Calgary. Uh, we have not been talking as our lead issue about electoral reform. We've, our lead issues have been what are we going to do about our health care crisis? How do we respond to youth unemployment? What's going on in Libya and why are no other leaders talking about it? When are we going to respond to the climate crisis? And how do we build a strong economy to be competitive in the future for Canadians? In fact, I think, I think anybody commenting on what they think is you know, a, a plaintive cry from Greens during this election uh, and that we've been just you know, talking about electoral reform, reflects sadly on the fact that the major national news media have not just failed to invite us to the debates, they haven't invited us to the election. And Canadians can find out what we're really saying only by going to our website and listening to speeches that I've given, listening to and, and looking at our, at our platform. 
uh, we have a very strong commitment, as you can imagine, to embracing the challenge of the climate crisis and converting it to economic opportunity for Canadians. We haven't been running an election campaign that's been whiny or negative. Our whole campaign has been to embrace a positive vision for the future, positive politics, absolutely rejecting mudslinging and negativity, and putting forward for Canadians a very serious, well-considered, and, and fiscally responsible program for early childhood education, for improved pensions, for, for improved health care and pharmacare. Our platform is so exciting, and we really don't run out of things to talk about. We haven't been running a negative campaign at all. Well, let's talk about it right now, because I know you've been telling us for years that while, of course, the Green Party stands for the environment, it stands for much more than that as well. And since you're right, health care yes. usually comes in as number one with a bullet when you ask people what's their chief concern. L let's ask about that. Uh, tell me one thing the Green Party is offering on health care that we haven't heard from the other parties so far. Well, I tell you, I was really proud that Holly Dressel, who's a, a health care expert, joined me in a press conference in Montreal to say she'd never seen such a good health care policy as the one we put, we've put forward. We deal well, with just one example with Pharmacare, a very innovative proposal to put forward a federal crown corporation to bulk buy, negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry to bring down the price of individual uh, prescription drugs, and to have an evidence-based, much more rigorous assessment of pharmaceutical drugs. This is the fastest growing component of our health care budget. It's one where we're largely held hostage to big pharma. We want to challenge that. We want to make sure we're not licensing drugs that actually have more negative side effects than they have benefits. And we have a very specific program for bringing down the price of drugs and for providing help to people in low income brackets who can't even afford those lower prices. So I'm, I'm really proud of our innovative pharma care plan. And I, I, I was looking forward to challenging the other leaders for what they were prepared to do to make sure that the drugs that Canadians are, are, are being prescribed will do more benefit than harm and bring down the prices of those drugs. Okay, as far as I know, though, PharmaCare is a provincial responsibility. So have you talked to all the provincial health ministers to see whether or not they're on side with your attempt to create a national uh, purchaser for PharmaCare? This proposal makes so much sense, Steve. The idea, yes, it would remain provincial jurisdiction, but they've got to buy the drugs from somewhere. So the opportunity is there with a federal crown corporation to bulk buy the pharmaceutical drugs and provide those to the provinces. So that doesn't take, it's not a jurisdictional issue at all. It's a question of do you want to buy your drugs from direct from the big pharmaceutical companies that want to make sure that they charge the, the highest price and obtain the largest profit? Or are you going to go with a plan that has worked in other countries, New Zealand, Australia? Uh, the Clinton Foundation used this approach to bring down the cost of HIV retro drugs and HIV testing for Africa. We know what will work to bring down drug pricing. And then the provinces can buy the drugs from the Federal Crown Corporation at a much reduced price over individual purchases from the pharmaceutical industry. I heard you mention pensions as well, and let's do a follow-up on that. We have heard the other parties suggest everything from pooled pensions of the Conservatives to a, a kind of a mix of a GIS top-up from the Liberals and a voluntary plan to doubling the CPP for the NDP. What's the Green plan on this? We need to improve pensions. We should stick with CPP. It, it works and it's also stable. It's not at risk. We need to also ensure that we protect the private pension plans of companies that go into bankruptcy so that pensioners and their pension funds are secured creditors in bankruptcy. We need to make sure that we immediately increase the guaranteed income supplement. But we also want to see a plan like RRSPs for municipal bonds so that people can save for their retirement by investing in their own communities. But overall, we think you know, we really do need to enhance the, the federal uh, CPP program. And we want to use some of the carbon tax revenue to reduce the cost to the employer and individual employee of both EI and CPP, replenishing those funds so that they're there from some of the revenue that comes in from taxing pollution. Much of the New Democrats' spending plans depends on what they've described as uh, revenues that they'll realize from putting a price on carbon and instituting a cap and trade policy. Mm. How would you realize your, first of all, actually before I ask you about yours, what do you think of their idea? Look, any idea that moves us forward, and one of the things that Greens keep stressing in this election is we want to work cooperatively. Uh, the toxic levels of partisanship that say nobody else has a good idea, I think, I think uh, Canadians are sick of it and it means we don't ever make any progress. So given the Liberal and NDP platforms, both of them are far better than the Conservative platform on climate. 
neither of them are anywhere near as good as ours. But at least we have a, a, a place of, of departure that they agree with carbon pricing. A cap and trade is a very cost, uh, transaction heavy way of approaching what a carbon tax does much, much more simply. Uh, most economists would agree it's the best approach. But unlike the NDP approach, which is to say, whatever we bring in from auctioning carbon credits, we will then use to fund, and this is what the liberals say, they will use this to fund other things. Our approach is different. We believe that, that carbon pricing should be revenue neutral. So whatever we bring into the economy and bring into government revenues from carbon pricing is immediately transferred into reduced income taxes. We raise the first income tax level that before a person has to pay income tax to an income of $20,000 or more. We make sure that we are able to bring in full income splitting for Canadian families immediately because we replenish the $5 billion that costs with money that comes in from taxing pollution. So our approach is different. It doesn't, in other words, every Canadian family will be at least no worse off with our approach and most will be much better off with our approach. Whereas the NDP and the Liberal plans it likely have those additional costs passed on to the consumer. And since their approaches aren't revenue neutral, uh, I think you'll have a harder time making it work and stimulating the economy and not having an additional burden on Canadian families. But as I said, overall, you know, anything that prices carbon is going to be better than the approach that we currently have, which is a conservative government that's done nothing but cancel any program that actually was potentially effective at reducing greenhouse gases in Canada. Let's do one more kind of uh, top of mind policy issue, and that is corporate income taxes, which have been very big in this election campaign. Uh, liberals want to put them up to, uh, I guess, 18 18%. Conservatives want to see them continue to go down to 15 percent. New Democrats want them up to 19 and a half percent. Where do you want to see them go? Well, I think we're guided on this by the advice of the parliamentary budget officer that Canada is in a structural deficit. Continuing to cut corporate income taxes is, is not <laughs> a responsible approach when you know a structural defi deficit means you're continuing to spend more money than you take in. We believe that corporate income tax rates should go to 2009 levels at uh, at 19 percent, so we're sort of in the middle there between the NDP and the Liberals. That any of these numbers between NDP, Liberal, or Green represents a competitive income tax. I mean, a competitive corporate tax level within the OECD. There is no justification for bringing us to where we are now, 16.5 or 15 percent next year. Uh, despite what Mr. Flaherty says, you can dress it up and call it a job creator, but there's no empirical evidence whatsoever. That cutting income, uh, that corporate tax rate reductions actually result in more job creation. It's simply not the case. It doesn't even result in more research and development. We have a real issue in Canada with, with the productivity gap between the United States. We need more R&D. We need a lot more participation from private sector. And so we'd raise hmm. the corporate income tax rate. And we would also go after offshore tax havens to bring in more revenue so we can bring down the deficit. Let me call this the, the, the catching a wave question. And uh, give me a second here to set it up. I, I think when you participated in the 2008 leaders debate, uh, when you did have that one seat in parliament in British Columbia, there were many people who well, thought- that, you, I, Steve, you have to say though, sorry, but the consortium had no rules. And in this, in this interview so far, it's, there's been an attempt to suggest that because we had a seat then, didn't have one now. Remember when we had a seat then, they said I couldn't be in either. They still have no rules. They still have no criteria. So it needs to be said, and I know you're, that you're not part of the consortium decision making. The decision in this case was massively anti-democratic and was made in the absence of any rules or criteria. So just to set the record straight on that, uh, they didn't have any rules in 2008. They didn't have any in 2011. The decision to exclude me was arbitrary and quite undemocratic. And I'm afraid the other leaders colluded with the media consortium to try to keep me out. And, I, and they succeeded in that. But it was, it was, I think, a blow to democracy even more than it was a blow to the Green Party. Well, I was going to do my catch the wave question, but since you're on it about the debate, I guess we may as well stick here. And I'll come back to my catch no, the wave question. No, catch the, no, 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 I'll come back to it. Wave. It's okay. We're, I'll come back to it. You're on to this now. I, I want to know, no, given, the fact, given the fact that you were not able to participate in the leaders' debate, how mm -hmm. much more difficult has it been for you to try to connect with the Canadian people because you didn't have that two hours in English and then two hours in French. It wasn't just that. I have to say, Steve, I've been shocked, for instance, uh, in the National Whistle Stop Tour that we just conducted. In 2008, when we departed from the train station in Vancouver, we had on board with us major national media. We had 
several national TV networks, a lot of the uh, major national print media. And in 2011, we pulled out of Vancouver without any Canadian media on board. So we weren't just not invited to the debates. Uh, the platform launch we held in Toronto, uh, you know, with a very positive vision, a fiscally responsible program with many exciting pro programs put forward. And yet the, the next day's uh, Globe and Mail didn't mention that I'd been in Toronto or that we'd launched a platform. So if I compare the two election campaigns, has it been far more difficult for us to get our message out? Yes, it has. Uh, maybe it's the debate that was the trigger for why they decided that Greens weren't really, uh, that our policy ideas didn't matter anymore, that hearing about what we thought about Libya or about uh, the climate crisis or about First Nations and justice in First Nations communities, these are issues that I feel have been orphaned in this election. They wouldn't have been orphaned if Greens had been in not just the debates, but in the nightly news coverage. And since you're giving me this chance, I do want to hear your catch the wave question. I'm <laughs> okay, sorry here it comes. for interrupting you. No, not at all. Here it comes then. I think in the 2008 debate, you did get to participate, and a number of political observers said, finally, Elizabeth May is going to have her moment in the sun. She's going to be on stage, equal to all the other parties. Let's see what she does. If she really hits it out of the park, you know, the public may catch the wave, and we could start to see some seats break for the Greens. It didn't happen. And then came the 2011 debate just a couple of weeks ago. Jack Layton, everybody seems to think, had a pretty good night. And a week later, his polling numbers, I mean, he's caught the wave. And I'm wondering, you know, what didn't happen in 2008 for you that clearly appears to have happened, so far anyway, still a week to go, but appears to have happened for Jack Layton this time? Well, you have to go back for one thing. In 2008, we did phenomenally well as Greens. We increased our vote to just under 7%. We got just under 1 million votes. And that was at a time that all other parties, all the other parties, were losing voters to a historic low voter turnout of only 59%. So we didn't end the 2008 election thinking that we hadn't caught the wave. We had a, a huge level, a huge surge in votes for the Greens in 2008. Now, what was the party strategy at the time? The party had never felt, because we're a very grassroots party, not hierarchical, the opposite of the kind of leader controls everything party that you see in other parties, we didn't even have it as a priority that I should win my seat. The big difference in 2011 is that we, you know, as a party, we focused a bit more, realizing that with the first past the post system, we could have 20% of the vote in every riding across Canada and still not win a seat. So as, as Jean-Pierre Kingsley, the former head of Elections Canada, noted in protesting my exclusion from the debates, he said, you know, really, it's, our, it's the vagaries of our voting system that resulted in the Greens not having a seat in 08. The level of voter support was roughly comparable to what the Bloc had, and they got 49 seats. So, you know, it, uh, you know I think comparing uh, you know, the two different election campaigns, what's happening in 2011 is strong support on the ground in Saanich Gulf Islands, strong support for other Greens, uh, Adrian Carr in Vancouver Centre, other candidates across the country, where the local strong campaign and the fact that we're getting a lot more youth engagement, a lot more participation through social media, uh, we're hoping that the green vote across the country is going to go up, and this time around, yes, you'll see Greens in the House of Commons at the end of this election. How do you know? How do we know? Well, I've, all I can tell you is that the, the message is back from, you know, nobody ever knows anything till Election Day, so this is not a statement of overconfidence. But for viewers who've been wondering where the Green Party is in this election, uh, please go to our website, find our policies, find our ideas, look for yourself and decide if this isn't the party you've always been looking for. And locally in Saanich Gulf Islands, all I can say is we've got tremendous momentum right now. Of course, we're up against a, a, a seasoned cabinet minister, but the support is building. Again, you know, we've got kids organizing, 12-year-old kids organize their own holding up Elizabeth May homemade signs and getting people to honk as they were going around the corner to vote in advance polls. A whole group of people who own sailboats set up their own flotilla with homemade vote May signs to, over the holiday weekend as, as the traffic went back and forth to Vancouver from uh, Swartz Bay near where I live on Vancouver Island with people cheering, honking horns. The support is uh, not the, your average election campaign. What we're seeing on the ground in Sandwich Gulf Islands is a, is a really growing wave uh, of support that wants to make history. Voters who are saying this will be the most exciting vote I've ever cast.
because Saanich Gulf Islands is going to make a difference to Canadian democracy. Well, and, and if I, I heard you correctly before we went on the air, you said this is your daughter's first chance to vote, and I presume she'll be voting in B.C.? Well, this is home. So, yes, Victoria Kate gets to cast her first ballot, and uh, many, many other young people, even young people who've had the chance to vote, young people who are 24, 25, 28, telling me this is the first time that they really feel motivated to vote because they know their vote's going to make a difference. Okay, with about a minute and a half to go here, Ms. May, tell me this. If you didn't have a chance to participate in the leaders' debate, you didn't get that chance to make that direct appeal to the voters in front of, you know, four million of them at once, uh, I can't promise you four million voters tonight, but I can offer you this chance to say something that people, you've been the leader of the party for a while, but say something to the people watching this program tonight that, that you think will help solidify a connection with them that you maybe haven't been able to do to this point forward. What do you want to say? If you're tired of the way Parliament is functioning, if you look at question period and think, gee, this needs a parental warning to keep children out of the room, and you want to see a change, a real change, then you want to look at the Green Party. We're, posit we're promising a positive form of politic, greater cooperation. We're not interested in cutting other p parties off at the knees. We want to figure out how we work together. In this country, we elect 308 MPs. We don't elect a prime minister. And every one of those MPs should be working for the people who've elected them. Our vision for the future involves a much stronger economy by embracing the challenge of a post-carbon economy creating millions of jobs across Canada, protecting our health care system, bringing in early childhood education, child care spaces, income splitting, and it's all costed. You can look on our platform, go to greenparty.ca, and you'll see a fiscally responsible platform where it protects, uh, you know, protects jobs and is very forward-looking. I was very proud that the Federation of Canadian Municipalities singled us out, as did Mayor Nenshi of Calgary, as the party that's put forward the most commitment to ongoing uh, infrastructure and development in our cities across Canada. At the same time, we're doing more to protect family, farmers, and local food than any other party. Ms. May, so if we were at the real debate, I'd have to cut you off here because we're out of time. It's good of you to okay, join well, us on Steve, the line just... from Victoria. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for your time.